what's done with the book. Seems amazing how long ago it was when we talked about the ascension back in chapter one, and now tonight we are moving to the end. Paul has preached, Peter has preached, we've seen great conversions, we've seen apostasy, we've seen dealing with heretics and apostates, we've seen dealing with the Romans and with the Jews, we've seen all kinds of very interesting things that interplay with the type of things that we face today. And now we are coming to the end and learning that some believe, everybody hears, but only some believe. And why is that? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we look into your word tonight, that your word would be like a spotlight that shines into our hearts as well. That you'll help us to understand with humility, with thanksgiving, and perhaps with some trepidation, why it is you have done what you have done. That we might examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith or whether or not we're castaways, reprobate. There are many sitting in churches today who think that they're on their way to heaven and they have no idea that actually they're on their way to hell. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand your word. Here is truth. Not that which man says is true, but what you have said is true. Why you have done what you have done. The end results of what you have done. How we are accountable, and yet you are sovereign. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 17. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, <coughs> Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I have ought to accuse my nation of, for, for this cause therefore have I called for you to see you, and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. That's a powerful statement. Jesus himself, the greatest preacher who ever lived, had some who believed and some who believed not. The Apostle Paul, to whom more revelation was given in the New Testament than to any other man, who understood the Jewish mindset and was trained in rabbinic studies, when he preached, some believed and some believed not. I suspect that within this church there are some who believe and there are some who believe not, though they have sat under the preaching of the gospel for many years, decades. In the introduction last week, we began to tie the method of to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles to two different important doctrines. First of all, we saw that that method produced what I have called the great equalizer in the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. That's the way everybody comes, both Jew and Gentile, but it was given first to the Jews. 
and it's traced all the way back to Abraham, who believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. But Paul makes the point that those who have priority, those who have blessing, have a greater accountability and a greater responsibility. To whom much is given, from him shall much be required. To you much has been given, and therefore from you much shall be required. Those who have priority have accountability and responsibility. That's true in every area of life, and it's a principle that we need to teach to our children and to our grandchildren. I really think that this is a lesson that young people in America have never learned. They want everything right now, and they want it their way. And you'd better hop to it, or they'll be mad and do something bad to you. But God made this principle clear of accountability, especially in relation to the gospel of Christ in Romans chapter 9, verses 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, who got all of that revelation which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? You think they had the entire law. They saw what God's righteousness was like. Wherefore? Paul asked the same question. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And he tells you who, not what, but who the stumbling stone is in verse 33. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So the first thing we talked about was the great equalizer in the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. The second thing that we looked at last week, we began to look at how the principle of accountability I wish we could learn that here. I wish that those who have positions of authority, those who have positions of privilege, those who have positions of blessing, those who have positions of power, not only in this church, but across our land, would learn the principle of accountability. But that, we noted last week, ties into the doctrines of election and predestination. The first thing that we looked at last week is how the term elect is used in the Bible. The term elect means not merely chosen. I hope you get some of these principles that I'm trying to give here. I'm summarizing some principles right now. It means to be chosen to accomplish a specific purpose. Elect and election deal with being chosen to accomplish a specific purpose. It is not only related to the doctrine of salvation, it is related to the divine plan of God whereby he accomplishes his goal with and for his moral creatures in every aspect of his universe. Election deals with the divine plan for accomplishing God's goal everywhere in the universe with and for his moral creatures. That's men and angels. Let me give you an illustration. If we were speaking in artistic terms... An artist does some election. An artist chooses the specific canvas on which he will paint. It might be a small canvas, it might be a medium-sized canvas, it might be a wall, or it might be like the Sistine Chapel where he's painting on the ceiling. He chooses the specific media. For example, he may choose oils or he may choose acrylics. He may choose pen and ink or he may choose pastel chalk or pencil and brush. He chooses the specific brushes for broad strokes or for fine strokes. These are all choices that are being made by the artist. He's electing certain things that are going to go into his ultimate portrait or painting. He chooses the specific colors. He may do it in full color. He may do it in sepia. He chooses the specific blends of colors. He chooses the specific placement of the colors and may even have sketched out the scene or portrait that he will paint on the canvas in charcoal. Now, you know, that's a very important thought there. Some of you have seen artists. I I used to be an artist a long, long time ago, very long time ago. Won some art competitions even, believe it or not. And sometimes on the canvas, what we would do is we would conceive in our mind what we wanted to paint, and then you 
You chalk it in to make sure that you're going to fit everything in the right perspective before you begin to paint. You know something that is very much like prophecy. We're talking about choices, and here we may be talking about prophecy, which gives us outlines and some of the details of the paint that is to come. God chooses the sessions and the times at which he will paint. The artist, in making all of the sovereign choices, can either use a subject which he portrays with precision, or he can paint in an impressionistic way. He's sovereign in deciding when the picture is complete. And anybody after that who changes it spoils what the artist designed. You cannot add to or subtract from or change a Rembrandt or a Michelangelo or a Titian without lessening their greatness. Election is the same way. It's not merely a question of God making choices. It's a question of God making choices with the most intricate and intense purposes for bringing, and here's the purpose of election, for bringing eternal glory to himself for he is worthy. I hope you got that. God makes the most intricate and intense choices with the purpose of bringing eternal glory to himself, for he is worthy. That helps us, I hope, to see, as we looked last week, helps us to see why elect and election are used in so many different ways in the Bible. Because it's like the painting of a picture on a great canvas. And you see prophetically the outlines traced for you, so you know what's going to come. The picture's not complete yet, but you know what's going to come because you see the outlines traced there. And the artist is choosing the exact colors, the exact brushes, the exact timing of the sessions whereby he will paint each different part of the canvas. And we don't know in advance which part of the canvas is going to be painted first, second, third, fourth, and so on. It's not a paint by numbers kind of a thing. It's very precise brush strokes. May perhaps take years for an artist who's painting something and he leaves it for a while and meditates on it. And he comes back and paints for a while again and leaves it for a while. He studies it. He looks at it. Dear friends, that's what God is doing in election because ultimately it brings the greatest amount of glory to the artist when the painting is complete and when it is perfect. And God is using election in your life to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ and he will not stop until he has completed his purpose because ultimately that purpose will be to bring him the greatest amount of glory throughout all of eternity so we saw what we've seen so far Christ is called the elect Israel is called the elect the Jews who will be saved in the tribulation are called the elect believers in Christ are called the elect Churches are called elect. The unfallen angels are called elect angels. You see, all of this goes back to God fulfilling his ultimate purpose. He makes choices precisely with all events in history and with very many different individuals and groups so that in the end, he will receive the greatest amount of honor and glory and praise. The elect are no longer under the condemnation that falls on the non-elect. Romans 8.33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. But we saw also in studying the doctrine of election that the elect have obligations as to how they will live. Therefore, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, here's what you're supposed to put on, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. He tells you how to interact in the next few verses where you're forbearing one another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. He tells us our election has obligations in terms of the way in which we live, not only personally, but the way in which we interact with other believers. Yes, if you're among the chosen, it's not so that you can be frozen and do nothing.
It's so that you can do what is right, what God has ordained. God specifically appoints certain Christians to preach the gospel to the elect. And Paul spoke of that as he wrote both to Timothy and Titus. We noted last week that election is tied to foreknowledge, not to fatalism. Foreknowledge does not mean merely that God looked down the corridors of time and saw who would believe and therefore he chose them, because that makes God subject to history rather than making history subject to God. God is not controlled by the history that he looks down and sees because nothing <clears throat> would ever have happened had God not acted first. And God could have chosen infinite number of plans. Instead of making Adam and Eve, he could have made Zork and Bog. He didn't. He could have made you know, three-headed people, and he didn't. He could have made people who looked like worms, and he didn't. You think of the infinite number of possibilities of what God could have done. He could have chosen not to make Satan. He made him as Lucifer, but he certainly would have known that Lucifer would rebel. If you have that look down the corridors of time type of a theory, and he could have chosen never to create Lucifer and have a creation in which there would be no rebellion. Foreknowledge is not merely God looking down the corridors of time and seeing what's going to happen and saying, biting his nails and saying, how am I going to fix this? It's God making precise choices in eternity past whereby all of his attributes would most perfectly be magnified and glorified, including his holiness, including his justice, including his judgment, whereby he judges sin and demonstrates to all the universe that not only is he sovereign, but he is holy. We're dealing with God, not with people and puny little ideas. Expand your thinking when you think about God. Foreknowledge is not fatalism. Foreknowledge means that God knew all the possible scenarios and chose the one complete. And you think of how many thousands of years have gone by and every detail. Not a sparrow falls without your father. It doesn't say without your father's knowledge. It says without your father. God's the one who makes the sparrow drop. The very hairs of your head are numbered. God has every detail, every leaf on every tree, every blade of grass that you guys have to go out there and push a lawnmower over. Every one of them is planned in perfect detail from eternity past because ultimately, and we don't see all of it now, but we're going to be learning throughout all of eternity how every bit of that brings glory to God. He will receive the maximum amount of glory because he is worthy. We saw election in that context in 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Do you see the purpose there? And do you see the means by which God accomplishes his goal? It says, through sanctification of the Spirit, that's the means that God uses. The Spirit of God set you apart if you are among the elect, not only for salvation, but, he says, unto obedience that relates to sanctification that relates to us growing in our Christian life whereby when the father tells us what to do we obey regardless of the consequences unto obedience and he goes back and shows you why it's possible because of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ you see God is personally involved in his creation. He's not merely running it like some kind of machine, and every now and then he pours in a little gasoline to keep the machine running. He personally intervened into history so that his purpose is in election 
would not only be accomplished, but he would be glorified because he has made the greatest of all sacrifices. Does he call on you to make a sacrifice? Oh, friend, he's already shown you that the sacrifice that he made is so much greater than anything you could ever imagine. And we gripe when we think we have to give only 10%. We gripe when it's a little bit warm in the auditorium. What did Jesus sacrifice for you? The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. He's talking about those who are elect here, what God has done for them, the means that he used, the foundation upon which he could do it righteously. Okay, so tonight we want to see how this fits together with the doctrine of predestination. You might say to me, well, aren't predestination and election the same thing? No, absolutely not. They're two separate distinct doctrines in scripture. Election deals with the purposes of God. Election deals with many different individuals, many different groups as we've seen, because God has things that he wants each individual or group to accomplish, which will ultimately bring him the greatest amount of glory. But predestination deals with God determining in eternity past the ultimate destination, predestination, before destination, the ultimate destination of all of his morally accountable creatures, both men and angels. They're obviously related, just like foreknowledge is related, but they are distinct doctrines because predestination is dealing specifically with the choice that God made concerning the end result of every one of his moral creatures. He determined their destinies in advance. I hope that causes you to tremble. You know, he could have chosen, and righteously so, a destination for every one of us in hell. He's holy, we are not. He is sinless, we are not. He is righteous, we are not. And because he is holy and we are unholy, he could have banished us forever to the lake of fire. The average arrogant man asks the question, how can a loving God send anybody to hell? Wrong question because it has the wrong premise. It assumes that the anybody is good enough to go to heaven, but God very capriciously decides to throw some of them into hell, and it means that God doesn't love them. It also fails to look at the cross. That's what a loving God did. He sent his own son to die in our place. So the question is not how can a loving God send anybody to hell? Because that has at least two wrong premises. Number one, it ignores the cross. And number two, it assumes that we deserve heaven. Both are wrong premises. The correct question is how can a righteous God send anybody to heaven? Because God is holy. There's no place in the Bible that says God is love, love, love. Did you know that? However, there is a place where it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah chapter 6. Remember, God is not only love, but God is holy. And his holiness instructs every one of his other attributes. For everything with God must be righteous. We do not deserve heaven. We deserve hell. And so the fact that God has chosen some through election for an ultimate destination other than hell is pure grace. People complain about that and do not understand grace. If you're on your way to heaven, 
It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the mercy and grace of God that has saved you. And if you're not saved, you should tremble because judgment is coming. And you are not ready. Predestination deals with God determining in eternity past the ultimate destination of all of his morally accountable creatures, both men and angels. The Apostle Paul talks about it twice in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me read these verses to you. I encourage you to read the book of Ephesians, the great book dealing with both election and predestination. The first three chapters are the doctrinal basis. The last three chapters, that's chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians. First half of the book are the doctrinal basis of how God shows us in Christ, in the beloved, in him. It says it multiple times in chapter 1. The last three chapters are, if you are elect, if you are among God's chosen, here's the way it applies to your life. And that includes everything from the way in which we're to love one another and, and treat one another to how we're to fight the spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6. One through three, the foundation doctrinally. Four, five, and six, those are the chapters that deal with how does that change your life. Study Ephesians. But let me read you the two verses that mention predestination in chapter one. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the fact that we were really nice people and he looked down the corridors of time and he saw, well, they're gonna believe, so I guess I'll choose them. That's not what it says, does it? It says, according to the good pleasure of his will. Not your will, not my will, his will. Not popular vote, not dictatorship. It's according to his will. And notice what he also predestined us to do. To move into that relationship known as adoption in the New Testament. Now that's a, a big subject. We're not going to have time to cover it tonight. But we are not only born into God's family, that's the new birth of John chapter 3, we are also adopted into God's family. Fascinating. You say, well, how can you be both born and adopted into the same family? Well, uh, the way the Romans understood it. A, a kid could be born into the family. Paul explains this in Galatians. A, a child can be born into a family. It's genuinely his father, genuinely his mother. But instead of the kind of homeschooling that we have today, it wasn't the the dad and mom who did the homeschooling, they had a tutor, a guy who had the authority even to spank the child, and not just spank him with a little bit of whack, to really beat the kid. And Paul tells us that we are under tutors, we are under these, you know, sort of despotic teachers, and he's comparing that with the law, until a very special time when God sent his son to the world. And he said, and then we went through a special kind of a ceremony that they had among the Romans. When a young boy would reach the age of puberty, they would hold an adoption ceremony. And they would take him down to the town council. They would go through a special procedure. A toga would be given to him instead of the kid clothing. And he would be declared an adult and able to inherit from his father. He was both born into that family and he was adopted so that he would be a legal heir of everything the father owned. Now, if God determines something in advance, will it happen? Everybody who says yes, please raise your hand so at least you're awake. Okay. I think everybody raised their hand. <laughs> I see some fans anyway. Okay. God will accomplish it if it's predestined. God has predestined us to the adoption of sons, whereby we become heirs, and Paul says joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Joint heirs, we have access to it all. Access to all that God the Son has access to. Pretty good predestined plan. 
You like the end results of that plan? You like the choice that God made that put you there and that is your ultimate destiny? If you like that, say amen. Amen. I sure like that. Now we go down to verse 11. In whom, that's speaking of in Christ, because the in whom's and the in him's and in Christ and in the beloved, all those phrases in Ephesians chapter 1 are referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. In whom, that is in Jesus Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance. Ah, that takes us back to verse 5. I just explained to you about adoption and about the full inheritance rights from the Father. We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who sort of controls most stuff in the future, but some of it sort of gets out of control. That's not what it says, is it? The purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives who like to disagree a lot on political. Is that what it says? The counsel of what? Of his own will. It's the divine counsels of eternity past that took place between the members of the Godhead. It's the counsel of his own will, nothing else. He doesn't need our input to make his decisions. He doesn't need the popular vote of planet Earth to make his decisions. How much of it does it say? Who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Those are powerful words. I hope you get that. That's the foundation for predestination that we're talking about tonight. Now, the word chosen is not only used in connection to election, but the word chosen is also used in relation to predestination, where God predestines an individual or a group of people to a certain destiny. We see that, for example, with Israel over in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. God says, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Whoa. <laughs> and there are people who don't like the Jews and think they're the problem on earth. <laughs> no, God says he has chosen them. Of course, it gets back to accountability, back to responsibility, what we talked about last week. He has chosen them as a holy people. He's chosen them to be a special people. He's chosen them above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Whoa. Look at chapter 12, verse 21 of Deuteronomy. If the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to put his name there be too far for thee, then thou shalt kill of the herd of thy flock which the Lord hath given thee, as I have commanded thee, and thou shalt eat in thy gates. In other words, God was choosing a place is that going to be a place that lasts not just in past time, but in prophetic future? Where did he choose to put his name? What's the name of the place? Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Where is the Lord Jesus Christ going to rule during the millennial reign? Jerusalem. What do we see coming down from God out of heaven as we get over to the end chapters of the book of Revelation? It's called the new Jerusalem. God has specific destinies for people in specific places. Deuteronomy chapter 14. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself. So not only holy not only special, not only above all people that are upon the face of the earth, but a peculiar people, a distinct people unto himself. Peter quotes this, and he says that principle applies to believers during the church age as well. Perhaps the most striking verses concerning predestination to salvation, I'll give you only a few of them, our time is running out here, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I hope you burn that verse into your mind. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning 
we're going back to eternity past, from the beginning, chosen you to salvation. I don't know how anybody can miss that. Chosen you to salvation. Let's try it again. Chosen you to what? Salvation. Did God make a choice? Yes. Or was it you that made the choice? God has from the beginning. Were you there at the beginning? No. Somebody made a choice in the beginning. It was a choice that related to salvation. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. And he tells you the process. We looked a little few minutes ago about the process that God has used to draw us to himself. And that's another word that we don't have time to cover tonight. But the irresistible drawing of God. Where like a fisherman with a great net and the fish can't resist, pulls them in. He draws them. It's a word that is used for pulling a sword out of its sheath in preparation for battle. The guy doesn't go, oh, oh, wish I could get my sword. Oh, here comes the enemy. Oh, oh, wish I could get my sword out. Oh, oh. He draws his sword. That's the word that's used for God irresistibly drawing the elect to himself to accomplish his purposes and to give them a destiny which he has chosen. Folks, that's powerful stuff. Those are beautiful word images. Magnificent graphic language that God uses to describe predestination. He has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Now he tells you the method. Through the sanctification of the Spirit. We just talked about sanctification. That means to set apart. God makes choices. God says, I'm going to guarantee my choices get to its end. The devil says, I'm going to come in there and stop it. I'm going to kill those guys before they can, can be saved. I'll, save them while they're, I'll kill them while they're still not saved. And then they'll never make it to heaven. He sets you apart by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He knows all the devil's plans. He knows all the contingencies of life. And when Satan tries to step in and stop the plan of God, he intervenes. He uses his holy angels many times to do that too. Through sanctification of the spirit. And then he tells you the mechanism by which he brings you to his ultimate chosen plan last phrase of the verse through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth we get back to faith is that that tension that balance that you have to have when you are looking at the eternal plan of God and then seeing it enacted in time present because we are morally responsible we are morally accountable actors we must act upon what God has revealed but you can't do it when you're dead. God has to intervene. God has to put the spark of life into you. God has to draw you to Christ. Otherwise, you would never believe. That's why in our text tonight, all hear, but only some believe. God is the determining factor in that. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. For many are called... But few are chosen. You know, this is also connected to what's been called the doctrine of reprobation. That is, chosen not merely for salvation, but chosen for damnation. When God passed over the rest, he made a choice. He could have chosen everybody. He did not choose everybody. We may not like that, but that's what the scripture reveals. There are those who call themselves universalists where they think that someday everybody's going to get saved. And that's sort of the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. You know, you go down there and burn for a couple of hundred thousand years and that'll burn all the, the rubbish out of your life and then you get saved. Listen, it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. Folks, when you step out of that body that you're in right now, you're either saved or you're lost, and you will not change your position at that point. You can't. You'd better make sure that you have trusted in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. That you really believe who he is and what he did for you. And you will see a transformation in your life, and if you don't, there's the question, have you ever truly believed? 
The doctrine of reprobation. Let me give you some illustrations. John chapter 6, verse 70. Jesus speaking to the disciples. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Whoa! I mean, Jesus knew in advance who Judas was. He knew what Judas was going to do. He could have made sure that Judas never got chosen. And Jesus is going around. He calls Peter. He calls James and John. He calls Andrew. He calls Simon. He calls Bartholomew, Thomas, Thaddeus. Uh, he calls these guys. He looks over there. Hmm. You know, I think I'll choose Judas. You know, he chose Levi, also known as Matthew, who was a tax collector, so that you'd think that if anybody was going to carry the bag, carry the money, be a trusted apostle, I mean, he's a guy who knew accounting. He had his MBA, you know. Uh, he, he'd worked in the business for a long time. He knew how to make sure money fit all the slots. They didn't choose him to be the treasurer. Jesus chose Judas even knowing how bad he was and that he was a thief and that he would steal out of the bag. John tells us so. And then when he came in, and I guess they voted, or maybe Jesus appointed him to be the treasurer. He gave him incredible opportunity. He gave him incredible closeness. He heard everything that Jesus said, except when Jesus alone with Peter, James, and John up on the mount. Every time the apostles were together, he heard what Jesus said. And he betrayed Jesus. And when he saw he had done wrong, he went out and hanged himself. And the Bible tells us that there was a special place in hell that was prepared for Judas. Folks, that's the doctrine of reprobation. But Judas was given a chance, wasn't he? Judas was given opportunity, just like you have been given opportunities. Judas blew it. Judas can never complain and say, well, but I never knew. I didn't know what Jesus was like. I didn't know how good he was. I didn't know he could do miracles. I didn't know he could raise the dead. Oh, you know. He knew, and he thought he was going to force Jesus' hand to become a political military king. Because he'd put him in a situation where Jesus couldn't get out unless he showed his great power. And instead, Jesus went to the cross and Judas went to hell. Reprobation. Let me give you another one. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. And a stone of stumbling, speaking of Christ, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, listen to the last five words, whereunto also they were appointed, being disobedient to the word, whereunto also they were appointed. That's reprobation. I hope you see how scary that is. It's not God doing something bad to them because they deserved it anyway. He made choices, and those he passed over, he chose by appointment for the things they do that end them in hell. Let me give you another one. Here we have a different appointment. This is an appointment for the believers. This is a great promise that believers will not go through the tribulation. This is a great promise that we will not have to suffer the wrath of God. We'll suffer persecution of the world, but we'll never suffer the wrath of God. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Appointed applies both to wrath with a negative, and appointed applies to salvation with a positive. He's not appointed us to wrath, but... Put in brackets, he has appointed us to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see both the doctrine of predestination for the elect and the doctrine of reprobation for those who are not elect. 
I can't believe it's 8.15 already. I have so many more verses here I want to talk to you about and, and many different categories. So I think we'll save that till next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are God. You are the true and living God. You are the God who is holy and righteous and just and pure. And you cannot tolerate sin in your presence. And yet all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But how we thank you for the second half of that verse. But the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're saved by grace through faith. That is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. A gift is the choice of the giver. He didn't have to give us anything. He could merely have shoved us off the precipice into the flames of hell. But Father, in your mercy and in your grace, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly. Father, I pray that if there's anyone listening to this message, whether in this auditorium or out on the internet or at some later date on a CD or DVD, that having heard the truths of your word, that you would use that to irresistibly draw them, powerfully, irresistibly, irresistibly draw them to Christ, that they might be saved. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight. And much in line with what we have just been studying, number 249, and could it, can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me, who him to death pursued. Amazing.